Joe, when we speak of public Christianity, or of Christian culture, or even of Christianized institutions, we tend to refer back to historical examples in the West. Now, I believe it's undeniable that Christianity has shaped Western society, but should we be trying to rediscover a past or a long-lost golden age? Or is there something better in the future that we should be working Yes, very often when the, the question of the gospel's relationship to culture is considered and we hear various analyses and critiques of where the culture is now, uh, the sense is that what we're really talking about is trying to recover a bygone golden age. Are we trying to move society back to the 1950s? Are we trying to uh, move society back to the Victorian era or... Are we trying to move it back to the Puritan age in the 17th century? Are we trying to actually get back to the high Middle Ages into, into the heart of old Christendom? Um, and of course, it's certainly true to say that in all of those eras, uh, there were, were a genuine um, faithful attempts to express the reality and truth of the gospel in concrete terms in the culture. And that affected the institutional life of the Western world. We can see clearly, and of course, much of the world, not just the Western world, but we're talking right now about the West. We can see how education was impacted. We can see how uh, architecture was impacted. Um, we can see how uh, political life and our political institutions were impacted by the reality of the gospel. Uh, less than perfectly, of course but they were impacted and influenced, certainly. However, I would say this, and I think this is very important, that <clears throat> we often hear people say today that we live in a post-Christian age. I don't believe that's true. Uh, people talk about it being post-secular as well. But we certainly are not in a post-Christian age. There has actually never been a truly Christian, consistently Christian nation, uh, a truly consistently Christian culture, since the advent of the Christian faith. There have been lots of uh, periods of history where there has been what we might call a synthesis of a Christian understanding and a Greco-Roman humanistic uh, understanding where they have been synthetically sort of brought together in an unhappy uh, partnership. But a consistently Christian culture, um, I don't think we have yet... Uh, seen one. So I believe we're in a, in a, in a pre-Christian age. Now that's important in answering this question because um, we're not primitivists. So what the Christian isn't saying is that there is some ideal past that needs to be recovered. That was the view of Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, one of the framers of the French social contract, the French revolutionary period. The idea there was that there was some kind of ideal primitive past, the noble savage, that if we could just get back to this bygone era, then we could realize the ideal state. Now, that is not Christianity. We, we recognize that God has ordained change and progress in history. That actually also means that um, we're not utopians. No Christian can be a utopian, uh, which carries with it the idea that man, by his will, by his uh, ingenuity by his ideas can somehow halt history and create a, uh, a permanent order where the reality of history and change um, it will where that order would be impervious to the the movement of of history and this ideal uh, egalitarian order um, could be realized no no Christian can be primitivist or utopian uh, in their thinking. Um, rather, the Christian recognizes, uh, actually interestingly enough, the reality of both progress and conservatism. It's important to notice that since the French Revolution, which was very much a watershed moment in, in the history of Western culture and socio-political life, that uh, we've tended to define ourselves in terms of the reaction to the revolutionary idea that human beings, based on their reason, can plan and order their own uh, society, not as a community under God, but just in terms of their own 
social contract, their own social agreement that individuals will sign up to. Uh, so that, that revolutionary movement uh, brought about kind of three different strands. There were the, the, the radicals who, despite the, the reign of terror and the beheadings and then the Napoleonic dictatorship, they wanted to be consistent with the, uh, the, all the principles of the revolution and, and immediately apply them. And then you had the moderates who agreed with the overall agenda of revolution against God and uh, community under God, but wanted to do it more slowly. And then you had the uh, conservative element who likewise um, agreed with the overall direction, but felt that there were certain traditions that needed to be conserved. And actually, that really parallels today's so-called uh, radical left liberals in the middle and the conservatives on the right. There's a general agreement that the direction is of, of revolution against God is fine, but it's the pace of change and how much one needs to conserve. Now, the Christian uh, is obviously not a radical or not a revolutionary, but what we believe is that in terms of the gospel and of the kingdom of God, God ordains progress in history. So we're not trying to get back to some alleged Christian ideal past, get back to some other era. We recognize that God has in his purposes for the gospel in history, progress for the kingdom. So the images of the kingdom in the New Testament are a mustard seed that grows into the great plant in the garden are of leaven that, gr that, uh, uh, that impacts the whole loaf, that grows and uh, expands the whole loaf. So you have starting small, becoming big. So there is progress uh, in history in terms of people's consistency with the gospel and their uh, service to God. We can grow in that just as we grow in sanctification. At the same time, we recognize that there are certain things that we need to, it's not all progress, there are certain things we need to conserve. So Paul even encouraged Timothy to hold on to those traditions that had been handed to him so that there are things from the past that are of value. So as Christians today, as we look at culture, what we do is we recognize that there were times in the past and things in the past where there was greater faithfulness to the gospel than we currently have. And so those things we seek to recover and to conserve. At the same time, we recognize that there was many areas in those eras of unfaithfulness and a lack of consistency those things we leave behind and we move progressively towards a greater faithfulness and a greater consistency to the reality of the implications of the gospel. In the same way that we would say that in the Christian life as individuals, that we, in sanctification and in our growth, we grow in faith, we grow in maturity, we grow in grace. Culture, when it reflects, because the gospel is a culture, when it reflects and it seeks to be more and more consistent with the gospel, will conserve that which is good and go beyond it to, to greater areas of faithfulness and consistency in the future. That's what we mean, that when we fulfill the Great Commission to teach the nations, uh, there is a, a growth in grace and faithfulness. So I believe that there is a greater fulfillment, and I believe the scriptures lead us to believe this, that ahead of us in history, culminating in the consummation of all things, when the kingdom is handed over to the Father, and Christ has put down every enemy, the last enemy to be defeated will be death, that ahead of us is a greater fulfillment of the reality of the gospel in history. That's something to be excited about. We are in a pre-Christian culture, and that the fullness of the reality of the gospel for socio-cultural life is still ahead of us.